In 1892, a reverend in the Roman Catholic Church recognized the need for improved health care in his area. He traveled to Portland, Oregon, and invited the Sisters of Charity to build a hospital in his area. In order to build hospitals, religious orders across the United States relied on private donations or sponsors for the funding. His area, Colfax, Pullman, and Plow City, all made competitive offers for the new hospital to be built in their town, and with an offer of free water, land, and an interest-free loan of $3,000 and another $5,000 promised from the Chamber of Commerce, the town of Colfax won the bid for the hospital. On April 17th of 1893, construction of St. Ignatius Hospital began while three Sisters of Charity provided care in a wooden building located on the site. The first patient was treated for pneumonia. Construction of the new hospital was completed and opened in 1894. Additions were added in 1917 and in 1928. The St. Ignatius School of Nursing was established in 1911 and graduated its first class of nurses. By 1936, a separate dormitory for nursing students was open. Washington State's first two male nurses also earned their degrees from St. Ignatius School of Nursing in 1941. Without government assistance, relying on donations and what patients could afford to pay made it very difficult for hospitals like St. Ignatius to make the needed upgrades as time went by. The Sisters of Charity were unable to keep up with the expense of maintaining and modernizing the hospital. And facing closure by the state and declining population in August of 1964, it was decided to close St. Ignatius Hospital and build a new facility. St. Ignatius Hospital became an assisted living facility until it was closed in 2000. In 2015, the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation added St. Ignatius Hospital to their 2015 Most Endangered Properties lists. Today, it said that ghosts of patients past now roam the halls of the hospital. It is the story of those ghosts that we are going to hear today on The Grave Talks. Valerie Gregory joins us to talk about the St. Ignatius Hospital. Valerie, take us back to a time where there wasn't health care, uh, even in existence in many towns. What was life like there in Colfax? Yep, first hospital in Whitman County, and the closest hospital to us before that would have been Spokane. Um, and right now, Spokane's an hour drive for us, so imagine how far it would have been in the 1800s to, to get medical attention. Huge need for the whole county, just because we we're really rural. Um, we still are rural. Uh, we're uh, in the middle of wheat fields and barley and uh, peas. We were big pea producers at that time. So they build this building, this hospital, this concept, really, that did not exist prior to its existence. What was the public reaction like, having such a care facility there in town? Uh, so the county loved it. They loved having the medical care, and it was pretty state-of-the-art. Um, they had x-ray, they had surgery, they had things that they had never really had before. Um, they had physicians that were, uh, you know, at the hospital all the time. Um, and so the community really supported it and the, and the county really supported it just because it was such a great need. There were elements of this building that were unlike what one may think of as an institution or a hospital. Want to tell us a little bit about the perception and what the building originally felt like. So the building itself was uh, very Victorian looking in the beginning, and uh, it had a big tower on it. Um, it had uh, balconies on the ends so that they were kind of sun porches so people could sit out on the ends and get um, fresh air and sun. Um, the floors are like a marble. I don't think it is marble, but it looks like marble. and. So it was very, um, you know, it was it was very homey, but at the same at the same point, it was very upscale, I would say. So when you went to the hospital, it was um, kind of top of the line. Um, and the nuns ran the hospital. They actually lived in the hospital, and they had um, rooms down on the first floor. And then the the um, you know the mother superior, she lived on the top floor. And some of the nurses actually lived in the hospital also. So it was a, it was a very caring facility, but it was, I would say it was very classy. 
in the beginning. Now, in the 1930s, they um, renovated, did extensive renovations because they needed more rooms, they needed to upgrade, they needed more equipment. And so then it became, it looks now it looks like what it looks like now is kind of more institutional like I would say Um, more like an actual hospital than what it looked like in the 1890s running such a facility was not an easy task especially with the method for funding the hospital so the the community really pitched in and helped them um, in the beginning because it wasn't profitable I think it took them about 15 years to become profitable, Profitable, but the businesses in Whitman County, the farmers, um, everybody pitched in to help them to make sure that it worked. And also the Catholics, it was a Catholic hospital. So everybody kind of pitched in to make sure that it succeeded. And then um, once it did start making money, then they were on their own after that. It struggled um, in the 60s, in the 1960s was because they were going to have to do extensive renovation because of all the laws that had changed. So they didn't have a sprinkler system. They didn't have big fire doors. They didn't have things that now, you know, you see in buildings all the time now. They didn't have that. So they were going to have to try to renovate this building that was built in 1893 and they, it, it was just going to be too much for them. And the sisters were kind of ready to get out of the hospital business at that point. So that's when the Colfax community stepped in. And actually Whitman County still, they all stepped in. And they decided to build a new hospital instead of renovate that one. Already a long history. Many people coming and going through those doors. And some maybe not exiting through the doors at all. At this point... What happened with the facility? So the hospital was sold to an individual, and he actually did all the renovations and put in the sprinkler systems and got it up to code, and it, and he turned it into a home for development disabled and the mentally insane, and it stayed open until 2003. What's unique about this building and this facility and the people who ran it, quite often when you hear of care facilities at earlier points in time the reputations are not always the greatest that wasn't the case here the reputation was actually really good like we've talked to nurses and people and like i grew up in this area um all of the residents that lived there really kind of became our family and they became um, part of our community they came to basketball games they made sure that they um that they they knew everybody in the community so our town is only 2700 people and so they would come downtown and shop, and and Roy McDonald was actually the owner, and that was that was his main goal was to make sure that they became a part of our community. It was wonderful, and to this day, his family still owns private homes, and they still are a big, huge part of our community. So everybody we've talked to have always said that the residents were really taken care of. It was a family-friendly place. Um, never heard any bad things about the facility but yeah it shut down in 2003 um just because it was too much to maintain and at that point there were only residents in the basement and on the first floor which meant the second third and fourth floor were empty and he just stored stuff in there which was super expensive because it was like it was radiator heat so he had to heat the entire building no matter what And so the expenses just became way too great. And so he moved them down the hill to a smaller facility that he already owned. And um, and then that place just became abandoned. I mean, when we walked in in 2015, um, they just left stuff, Uh, everything. I mean, furniture and um, clothes. And it was it it was kind of eerie because it was like they just shut the door. Take us through that span of time from 2003 to 2015. I mean, that's that's uh, an entire childhood lifetime uh, for many who may have grown up in the area. And to have the big old abandoned building sitting there, I imagine it was filled with stories and local legends. So in that amount of time, it was always known, even, even when it was open, 
it was always known that it was haunted. It was always known as the haunted hospital on the hill. Um, and in that amount of time when it was abandoned, lots of kids broke in. Um, I would say, if, if you talk to the police, they would say weekly, they would get phone calls that they would see flashlights in there. They had squatters that lived in there. In fact, I've talked to one of them. He actually has a job now and is like a normal human being, but he said he lived in there for a year up in the nuns area because at that point it was all boarded up. So a lot of times you couldn't see the flashlights in there because it was, you know, everything was boarded up. Um, but yeah, it was, it, and that's when it kind of came into disrepair is the roof kind of got bad and the paint started peeling and, um, you know, as kids went in, there was graffiti on the wall and they would go in and party. And so it was definitely the place for kids to go to get scared because they had heard the stories that it was haunted. Now, we live only 20 miles from two major universities. And so those University of Idaho and Washington State University, those kids had a heyday. They would come over and break in and try to go through because it was so scary. Most of them didn't do a lot of damage when they went in or they just wanted to go in to get scared. So um, that's kind of what happened in that time. The police were really busy in those years just trying to keep people out. Was there any basis to any of, of the rumors or the legends that surrounded the building uh, at that point in time? Yeah, so over the years, even when it was open as a hospital, uh, nurses would report that they would see things down the hallways. Um, when it became the place for development disabled and the, men and the mentally insane, those workers, because um, I would have been in high school in the 1980s, those workers would always come back and say that they saw things or heard things that they couldn't explain. Um, once it was shut down, all the neighbors would always say that they would see people standing in the windows, um, kind of hear strange things in there. And so over the years, there had been lots of stories from people who had actually worked there. So I think that's probably how the, you know, all the, all the stories started was when it was still open and then it just and then it just led on from there just because it is a big huge 50,000 square foot creepy building so after sitting abandoned for for so many years what was the thought process and how did it all begin to take the facility and and turn it in to a a place where people can go and study and learn about the paranormal so I started, uh, they, they hired my position in 2015, and it was actually my first day on the job. And since I grew up in this area, the first thing I asked was, what are you doing with St. Ignatius? And they said, well, it's abandoned and it's owned by a private person. And I said, well, can I have his name? Because I think that if we do ghost tours or historic tours in there, that people would come from all, the, all over the country. Now, I'm pretty sure the mayor thought I was crazy. Um, but I told him just stick with me on this one. Um, and he did. And I got about 30 volunteers that helped me clean out the hallways and make sure that everything was blocked off that wasn't safe. Um, and really the whole community kind of came together to help out with this too. And so that's kind of how it all started was just from an idea that, you know, these uh, ghost tours are huge and people love the history and so many people want to get in this building that me, we might as well let people in legally without them having to break in. And so um, it has been a big hit. We have we've sold out every single one of our tours. Um, I, I've had tours in February and March this year, and I'm sold out already for both of those months. So, yeah, even in the winter, like right now it's four degrees here. So <laughs> even in four degrees, people will come in, yeah. <laughs> So you get in the doors and you decide, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to get this thing open up to a safe enough state where people can explore it. What were your experiences initially when walking into this building? So I was the big skeptic. I was the person that was like, you know, there's lots of people that believe in this. Let's let's get them in here see what we can do. Um, I was the one who had to be in there by myself in the beginning um, just to kind of go through and do things. And um, that's when, that's when I realized that there was more to this than, than I had thought. Um, I have seen full shadow figures 
going up the stairs. I have had voices. I've had somebody tap me on the shoulder. I've had somebody kick me in the back of the leg. Um, it, it, it is it, it was it was scary to me at first. But then I realized that okay, I don't think they're gonna hurt me. I don't think I think they're just curious why I'm here. And so then I would just start talking to them. I'd have full-on conversations with them as I went in just to let them know what I was doing. Um, people have gotten EVPs in there. Uh, we hear lots of footsteps, lots of shuffling and running up the stairs as if there was an emergency. Um, and so it, from the very beginning, it was very evident that something was going on. Um, and I'm sure we stirred up stuff by coming in because it had been abandoned for so long. Uh, but almost every single person that came in with me had something happen to them. And being the, the big skeptic, as you said, did you ever have any moments where you just thought, okay, maybe this is a little bit more than I bargained for? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, in my head, I kept thinking, great, I'm the one who has to do the walkthrough at one o'clock in the morning to make sure nobody is still in the building. And now I'm going to have to do that by myself. So, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, geez, what have I done? Um, but then it almost, it almost becomes addicting. And I'm sure other like paranormal investigators will say that if you that you visited with, it was it was almost like I had to go back. It was almost like I had to tell their story. And so we myself and my volunteers really delved into the history of it. So when we do our tours, we tell the whole history of the building. We have names of people who passed away there. We have names of people who worked there. And that was so interesting to see, like, over the years, what had happened in that hospital, how many lives were saved. Um, you know, we found out that Colfax was the epicenter of influenza in, the ni- in about 1917. It wiped out entire families. So, you know, we have dealings of lots of little kids in there, which would make sense because, you know, of that. So we learned a lot about Whitman County as we did this, but it really is um addicting like then i just wanted to keep going in um so i kind of i got i felt i knew how everybody else felt by wanting to go in there it's almost as if the building is drawing you in making you a part of it making you want to be there want to stay we hear this quite often in the stories that we get on our other podcast real ghost stories online people feel an unexplained connection sometimes to these buildings. Let's talk about some of the people that are still residing there. One of the rooms that's always been really interesting to me is the room that I call my office because I have like a table and chairs in there and sometimes a little space heater because we don't have electricity, but we do have propane heat. So we have a little space heater in there. Um, That's the room I kind of hang out with in a lot when we have private tours. And so that was Donald's room. Um, And he would have been a resident there in about the 1980s, 1990s. He had Tourette's. Um, And so his room has really thick walls. And I will hear walking in the bathroom. I will hear things moving. I've had investigators come in there and just leave their recorders in there. And on their recorders, it sounds like furniture is being moved. I mean, loud, loud. Um... They have got they have gotten voices on their recorder, and it's a man cussing, which which is funny because he had Tourette's. Um, lots of people will bring stuffed animals to him, especially like bunnies, because he loved Easter, and so people there's lots of bunnies in that room. Um, uh, but that room I kind of have a connection with because I hear something all the time. Like I I always know he's in there. He will make the meters. He can make all of our meters go off. We'll set up meters in there, and he'll make the REM pod go off. He'll make the k go off um, all the time. So I'd say he's he's really active. He's one that's, that's pretty strong. Um, we've had about eight different psychics come in, and every single one of them have said, oh, that man is cussing in there. And, that's, and I don't say anything to them. So um, for them to be able to pick out that room and know that that's, 
that's who that was. Um, that's kind of mind boggling to me, but, um, I knew Donald growing up. So, um, I kind of knew things that he liked. And so I, I usually sit in there and we'll visit with him when I, when I do my tours. Um, on the first floor, it used to be admissions and that floor is one of our more active floors. That and third floor are probably our most active. It was also ER. So the doctors, when the ER, when they would come in from the ambulance, the doctor would say left or right. And in his head, he was saying right alive, left, you're dead. So if you went left, you would go into rooms where they would keep you comfortable until you passed away because there was absolutely nothing they could do. Um, so lots of people passed away on that floor, and I'm pretty sure that's probably why it's so active. Um, we have, in on the first floor, it's a little creepy, we hear brooms drop, but there are no brooms on the floor. So we could be in the kitchen area and out in the hallway, you'll hear a wooden broom drop. We go out there, there's nothing out there. And that happens a lot. Um, just uh, lots of lots of shadow figures on the in the first floor. Um, we have a police officer who won't go past a certain area towards the ER because he saw a full he saw a full body shadow figure walk from one door to the other. When we went down to that area, there is no door there. They would have had to walk through the wall. Um, so we set up a lot of laser grids on that floor just to see if we can get shadow figures. Um, on the second floor, not as active. In the beginning, that would have been where a lot of the um, OB patients were, so a lot of babies. So, like, I was born in the hospital in 1966, um, and my my mom's room was on that floor. So, I, on the tour, I always show my room. Um, on that floor, we have a we have a, a confessional that's pretty active. It's actually the original confessional, and um, we'll have people hear voices in there. Lots of EVPs, um, lots of walking. Even when you're standing in the room, you can hear people walking behind you. Um, third floor, I would say, is definitely our most active. We have a gal named Rose that is up there. She was schizophrenic and um, lived there for about 30 years, I would say, in like the 1970s. And um, she will turn on flashlights. She will make all the meters go off in her room. Um, lots of voices on recorders in that room. Um, the entire third floor is active, even in the hallway. We'll hear people running up the stairs. We'll have um, little kids giggling in one of the rooms. Um, when you're walking down the hallway, it always feels like somebody's right up on you, even though nobody's behind you. Um, we will get people touched. That's usually a lot of people will be touched or um, on the back of the leg or uh, on their shoulder, almost like they're trying to get around you. I've had numerous people say, oh, excuse me. And then I look at them and they're like, oh, did you just touch me? I'm like, no, I didn't. So we get lots of things like that going on. I have one room on the third floor that we know a little girl passed away because she drank chrome cleaner. And one of the nurses that came on my tour said that it was the worst day of her life. She had to literally watch this little girl pass away in that room. I, I can't go into that room. I get emotional. Um, it, it, lots of stuff. It's, it's heavy. The feeling's heavy when you go in. I've had quite a few psychics that won't go into that room. They just stand back and some of them don't even know why. Um, she, she'll move things. We've put a ball in there and she's moved a ball across the room. Um, we have a toy, like a little toy duck that we put in there. And when we come back, it'll be moved and we're the only ones in the building. Um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting room. Um, on the fourth floor, it was surgery. So, I mean, imagine how many people passed away in, in that area. So we have a, a big surgical unit um, that is pretty active. All the meters will go off. And on that floor, I have lots of people who get emotional. I have, I have had people cry. 
I have people like they look at me and they're like, I have no idea why I'm crying right now. I have no idea why I'm so emotional. Um, but like numerous people do this on their tour and they've been fine on all of the other floors. They've just been normal. They've been, you know, and once they hit that top floor, it just seems to get really emotional. There seems to be a little bit of a darker entity on, on, on the east end of the fourth floor. Um, I have psychics and I had a shaman come up there and they all said to me, I'm not going over there. Like, absolutely not. Um, and so I, I don't know. I don't know what the stories are on that side of the floor. Um, but it, it's everybody seems to get a really bad feeling over there. Um, the nuns area was on the fifth floor and, um, that seems like a pretty light, airy place. Um, we always feel like somebody's watching us when we go up there. It would have been an area of the hospital that you weren't supposed to go to. Only the nuns, and there was, would have been three of them that lived up there. Only those three could go up there. Like nobody was, else was invited up there. So I don't know if it's just because of that, because we knew that we weren't supposed to be up there, but you kind of get that feeling. But we don't get a lot of activity on in that area, but it just kind of gives you, it's, it's just kind of a different feeling as you go along. Would you say that the entities that are still there are in fact conscious and aware of their presence still in this facility? Yeah, I feel like there's, I think there's both because I've had experience, I've had one experience on the fourth floor that I heard, I heard what sounded like three or four people running up the stairs towards me. And as I shined my flashlight over, there's nothing there, but I could still hear the noises running up. And as I went towards it, it stopped. Um, and then we heard doors opening and shutting at the same time. So, but I've never heard it again. And it was, it was, it was scary. I had kids in there after a homecoming dance. Their parents paid for them to come in after a homecoming dance. And, and the kids were crying. I was, it, it was, it was probably one of the scariest nights I've ever been there, but I've never heard it again. And so I think that was almost residual. Like there was an emergency in the hospital people would have been running up the stairs but I've never heard that again but I do think the other stuff is intelligent um, we can get them to answer stuff on our meters we'll ask something and the meters will go off um, and so yeah I think I think they do know we're there I think they um, you know answer things that we're asking um, I think it is more intelligent and quite often when there's a haunting going on, the thought process that a lot of folks jump to is how do I help these people or entities or whatever it may be, move to the light, move on, go to their final resting place, destination, happy place, whatever you want to call it. I'm wondering, because it, it, it truly to me sounds like a lot of these entities, or many of them anyway, uh, seem fairly happy there. They seem like they're at home, like this is where they want to be. Uh, and maybe this is one of those places where it's not necessarily needed to help people move on to the next step. Maybe this is their next step. Maybe this is where they want to be. Yeah, so that, that was one question that we asked, like some of the psychics and some of the people that came in, because we have lots of people on our tours ask that. They'll say to me, and and like, I'm not an expert on any of this. I've just, you know, I'm sure I've been on 500 tours in there, but I don't, I don't know any of that, but um, they will ask us, they'll say, why are they still here? And my answer is because I think they really liked it here when they lived here or when they worked here. Um, it was their happy place. And that's what a lot of the psychics have said. They said they love it here. And they've told us that they love that we're in there telling their stories. Because we'll tell personal stories about Rose and we'll tell personal stories about Donald and Richard and people that we knew that I knew when I was growing up. Um, and then, like, I had uh, uh, some of my um, family members were actually nurses in the building. So we'll tell stories of, of them while they're in there. And I, I do think it's a happy place for them, and I, I think that they love that we're there. Um, 
And I don't know about them crossing over or leaving or whatever. You know, maybe they do. Maybe some do leave and maybe some come, come, you know, with other people as they're on the tour. I don't know. But we do seem to um, get responses when we say certain names in there, um, especially Rose and Donald and Richard. Um, so I, I do think that those people are still there. And obviously not all hauntings end happy, not all deaths are happy. In fact, very few of them seem to be. Can you tell me a little bit more about the man that people say they see the image of, the image of his crushed body between two rail cars? Yes. Yeah, E.F. Martin. So he is, he's one that we've always thought was there. Um we'll talk about the railroad and as soon as we talk about the railroad all the meters will go off we have had um, paranormal teams come in and they'll 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 have history on him or history about when the railroad came in and when they talk about that on their EVPs there's a man's voice and he'll actually answer their questions like yes or no or or say railroad or so we definitely think he's still in there. Um, he was he was crushed between two cars. Um, he was one of the first first people up there, and um, there was really nothing they could do because he was so far gone. Um, and he would have been the first person that passed away in Saint Ignatius. And and people still seem to see his his spirits almost looking as it did yes. after the accident. Yes. Yes, exactly. I think uh, people have seen seen figures in the hospital where they think it was a railroad person. And and again, I, I don't know. I've personally never seen that, but others have, um, have said that over the years that that's what they've seen. Obviously, this building is still home to many, many souls who call it home after the living portion of life. What does the future hold for this facility, for this? So we have a new owner now, and um, in the beginning, when I first took him through before he bought it, he was looking at the facility, and uh, I, I had told him, I said, well, you know, it's known to be haunted, and he laughed, and he said, well, I don't believe in, in spirits, and I said, yeah, that's fine. Um, I said, so, I said, do you know what you're going to go do with the building? He goes, I have no idea. And um, so that's when I approached him and said, well, we do these ghost hunts. And I told him how many people come to Colfax, Washington, this itty bitty town in Washington State, um, for these ghost hunts. And he said, well, you can keep doing those and until I figure out what I'm going to do with this building. And I'm like, okay. So we, we pay him a portion of the funds that we get from the ghost hunts as our rent. Um, he's talked about turning it into like industrial apartments because the ceilings are huge. I mean, they're super tall. The building's huge. The rooms are huge. And so he's talked about that. Um, he's also talked about turning the power plant, which it has a separate building for the power plant. He's talked about turning that into a brewery. Um, and I told him he would have to call the beer St. Ignatius Spirits because everybody knows about St. Ignatius now. So um, he, he talked about kind of a variety of things. But he doesn't have anything really set in stone right now. I think it's a little overwhelming for him just because the building's so big. And he got a pretty good deal on the on the property. And so um, I don't think he's in any real big hurry. And he knows that we're, he's kind of helping out the community by letting us keep doing these just because so many tourists come to town. And we get to tell the history of our town, you know, in the, in the tours. So... Right now, he doesn't have any solid plans. He just has continued to work with me. So that's kind of where we're at right now. It's good to hear they're still going to have their home. Yeah. We'll ask, like on our tours, we'll say, um, if hey, if Derek uh, renovates this place, will you stay? And when we say that, all the flashlights turn on and all the meters go off. So we laugh every time. We're like, okay, they're going to stay if he renovates. So just so everybody knows if they live in that place, it'll probably be on it. <laughs> to find out more about the St. Ignatius Hospital in Colfax, you can visit their website at colfaxhauntedhospital.com.
The link is also on our website at thegravetalks.com. That wraps up today's episode of The Grave Talks. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. And if you've given us a review on Apple Podcasts or any of the platforms, thank you so much. That's what's helping this show grow and letting other folks know that it exists. So please do so if you've not done so yet and leave a review. Also let your friends know on social media about our new podcast, The Grave Talks. Until next time, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.